Oasis Audio presents Price of Privilege by Jessica Dota, read for you by Amanda McKnight. Chapter 1 How curious it is at long last to write about the trials. Long have they been guarded, the truth kept veiled. At first it wasn't proper to speak of them when so much is lost, who can bear to trample over the little that remains. One afternoon, years afterwards, sadness overtook me, and as I stood in the cool shade beneath leafy bowers, I realised my opportunity to disclose the full truth had passed. Lives were tentatively healing, and to speak would have been disruptive. By that point my name was so besmirched by lies, accusations and assumptions, my only defence was to allow the remainder of my life to testify to my true character. During that period I faced the fullness of myself— and glimpsed the substance of my soul. What a strange law it comprised, fear intertwined with hope, cowardice lumped with bravery, innocence amassed with sin. It is no wonder in my case God demanded a crucible. We often fail to recognize our greatest godsend simply because it comes bundled in suffering. Thus only now, as I prepare to chronicle those fateful months, have I reopened memories long stuffed into boxes, stored in dusty closets of forgotten chambers. Each box opened contains something precious, yet equally cruel. As I bring forth the last of these remembrances, the picture finally clears, and I am able to comprehend how stunning the events actually were. What strange nonsense I must seem to write. The babblings of an old woman, a moneyed dowager at that. Yet have I ever used pity as my cloak? Was I not born despised and unwanted? Only a strange twist took me from being unheeded to being one of the most influential voices of the century. Who could have predicted such an end? Who could have foreseen the vast power and wealth that my name would one day accrue? Hm, but I am off point. I begin at the end of a story that most think they understand, though in truth... They know nothing about. The first morning I woke in Edward's arms, I stirred in my slumber, feeling a deep sensation of lament as if something had slipped through my fingers, though I could not place what. Shivering, I shifted position and pulled the blanket higher. The nap of homespun cloth scraped my skin. My eyes opened. No London house sheets were these. The very first sight that greeted me was a window framing the beginnings of dawn. Only the trunk of the nearest tree could be seen in the morning fog, its branches seemingly disappearing into the mist. A grey light, thin as gruel, seeped into the cramped chambers, recalling me to my surroundings. My breath frosted the air as I thrilled with gratitude. Of course, this was Edward's church and today was Henry and Elizabeth's wedding— I shifted onto my back and viewed the century-old slatted wood ceiling that had been resurrected as an addition to the sanctuary. The stark architecture was so unlike my father's lavish houses that I couldn't help but give a silent offering of thanks. It was as if I'd been drawn out from stormy waters and placed on the solid planking of a ship. Here I would become myself again. Last night I scarcely dared to sleep, fearing that I'd wake and discover this all a dream but now the acceptance that this was actually true prevented all chance of returning to slumber. I turned on my stomach and propped myself on my elbows to hungrily take in every detail of our home. To call that space a chamber was a decided compliment, yet I adored every inch of it. How much better I understood the nap of wool over the gloss of satin. A single table served also as a desk, evidenced by the books, Bible, inkwell, and parchment laid out in orderly stacks. There were only two chairs, one shoved beneath the desk, the other in the corner where it doubled as a valet, holding Edward's extra folded clothing. Next to it, a single fireplace with a rough-hewn wood mantle provided both the kitchen and heating source. I gave the cast-iron pot hanging from the crossbear a dubious look. "'Surely Edward wouldn't expect me to cook,' I frowned, pulling the blanket over my chilled shoulder. "'In the past I'd kept Sarah company while she dressed poultry, but I'd never heeded her work. "'And nearly six months with Pierrec, my father's world-renowned chef, "'hadn't extended my skills beyond choosing the proper sauce and embellishment. 
that knowledge hardly constituted what Edward needed in a wife. Edward stirred, emptying the pocket of warmth trapped between us. His cold nose nuzzled through my thick hair. Sleep rusted his voice. Awake already, Jules? Instead of answering, I snuggled tighter against him, savouring his warmth. He planted a sleepy kiss on the back of my head, then slung an arm across me to pull me close. The girls will be here soon to decorate, and I doubt our news has circulated. Besides, it's getting late. We should rise. I squeezed my eyes shut. Clearly we needed to discuss what constituted late. I hitched the blanket higher. You forget, we told Mrs. Wyndham we were married last night. I warrant the entire village knows by now. What? And risk that our news might upstage Henry and Elizabeth's wedding? Surely not. Smiling, I opened my eyes. Don't you think hiding it is more of a hazard? Someone else might catch wind and spread the news first. Trust me, everyone knows. All right, Edward jostled the bed as he repositioned himself. What do I get when I win? When you win? I turned and settled on my back, then viewed the tousled silhouette of Edward. He studied me as he propped on one elbow. Even in the semi-darkness, the love in his eyes created quiescence within me. They say the ancients believed peace was a rare gift bestowed on mortals they favoured. In that moment, I understood the belief. My cup couldn't have been fuller. I stretched, giving him a mischievous look. Teasing filled his eyes. Hmm, how about a fair share of the blanket? I gave a mock pout. That's your best demand. I... He traced the outline of my face as he leaned forward to kiss me, but then merriment crinkled his eyes, and from my peripheral vision I noted that his right hand inched toward the edge of the blanket. I tilted up toward his kiss, but just before our lips met, I shrieked with laughter and yanked the blanket hard, then rolled over and cocooned myself in wool. Edward roared with laughter. Why, you little! The straw in the mattress shifted as he pinioned me between his knees and searched for a seam. That's it. As your husband, I'm taking full charge of the blanket and its distribution. ICS dabbed my skin as his hand found an inlet. I gave a squeal, prepared to defend my soul right to the bedclothes. Edward, stop! Don't you dare! It's positively freezing! Trust me, I know. He continued to unwrap me as I, in turn, struggled to make it more difficult. I'm beginning to suspect, he cried, that you, Mrs. Edward Auburn, are a cover thief, and there's only one proper punishment for thieves. I could scarcely breathe from laughing, but still managed to keep myself enveloped by twisting every time he got the advantage. And what is that? He stopped wrestling, triumph filling his eyes. A thorough dunking in the horse trough. I gave a gasp of horror as he hefted me up in the blanket and tossed me over his shoulder. For a startled second, all I could see was my hair cascading toward the floor, where I feared it might be long enough to mingle with the crushed leaves and clods of dirt. When he started toward the chapel, however, I tried to kick free. You wouldn't! Oh, wouldn't I? I'll scream! I threatened as he headed straight down the centre aisle of the sanctuary. Edward laughed, ready to answer, but then he stiffened, turned and rushed back. Twisting, I did my best to rise up far enough to see what had alarmed him. Outdoors, Henry sat upon his steed. Frowning, he squinted at the row of arched windows. Though it was too dark for Henry to see inside, I had little doubt he'd heard our commotion and was debating his best course of action.'